Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our mRNA Day 2020 celebration. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes, but we're going to give everyone a chance to log on. So again, the webinar will start in just a couple minutes. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you again for joining us today for mRNA Day 2020, a celebration of the past, present, and future of mRNA. So in 2019, we had our very first mRNA Day celebration. That was a celebration of our new TriLink headquarters, which we moved into, as well as mRNA itself. The city of San Diego declared mRNA Day to be a holiday, and we were very excited to celebrate with the entire San Diego biotech community. We were able to move into a beautiful new facility with 105,000 square feet, as well as 50,000 square feet of custom designed manufacturing and laboratory space, which also enabled us to scale up and meet the demands as mRNA continues to grow and become a factor in the biotech market. This year, of course, with COVID-19, mRNA Day had to take a slightly different format than previously, and we'll discuss that as we move into the presentation. At TriLink, we offer many different services covering everything from oligos and TPs and custom chemistry to CleanCap, which is our <laughs> natural CAP1 capping analog, as well as mRNA, now plasmids as well, analytical services, and GMP manufacturing. So for mRNA Day 2020, we wanted to continue the tradition of celebrating mRNA, but with COVID-19, we were unable to do an in-person event as we did previously. So for this year, we decided to open mRNA Day up to the global biotech community with a free online symposium celebrating leaders in the field of mRNA. For today's presentation, we have two pioneers of the mRNA therapeutic platform presenting. We have Dr. Catalin Carrico, who's a senior vice president at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals, as well as Dr. Drew Weissman, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. Following the presentations by Dr. Carrico and Dr. Weissman, we will be having a live Q&A. You will be able to submit your questions via the questions panel on your GoToWebinar application. If your, if your question is for a specific presenter, please indicate that and we will direct it to the appropriate person and we will answer as many questions as possible within the allotted time. If we run out of time, we will attempt to follow up these questions for you by email. And so with that, we will be moving into our very first presentation by Dr. Catalin Carrico, Senior Vice President of, at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals. Thank you everyone for joining us. So I was asked to talk about the story of the mRNA, but I realized that you can read in different reviews, so I rather will tell my story of the mRNA. I will talk about today my humble beginning and biological research center, Saget, Hungary, my postdoc years at Temple University, and how all of these prepared me for the 24 years I spent at University of Pennsylvania trying to develop mRNA into therapy. When I was a student, I approached Tibor Farkas, who worked at the <clears throat> Biological Research Center, to spend my summer in the laboratory. And he told me, hey, forget it, you can spend the rest of your life in the laboratory. Go and work in my collaborators, the Fisheries Institute. And uh, uh, so this is what happened. I went the whole summer and collected uh, samples from farm fish and analyzed the lipid content and analyzed also that how uh, temperature can change uh, fatty, acid, fatty acid composition of uh, different uh, uh, creatures. When the summer was over, I went back and um, started to work in the main building, the Biological Research Center in Szeged, Hungary. And uh, two colleagues, Ernie Duda and Eva Kondorosi, approached Tibor that they needed phosphatidylserine because they want to do liposome. I was so excited to participate in this project, so uh, I said that uh, I would uh, like to join them because it sounded interesting that to uh, make liposome and put the DNA in it and deliver it to the cells. And I have to tell you, this was in the uh, 1970s, and uh, phosphatidylserine was not available, and Ernie had to go to the 
Schlotterhaus and uh, Collecti, the uh, big code brain. And we spent the whole week extracting the different fractions when the last day, finally, we, did, we could have this phosphatidyl serine, phosphatidyl ethanolamine, phospholipid fraction. And together, we did um, uh, using a method of so-called film method and made liposome, put uh, plasmid in it, and uh, delivered into mammalian cells. And uh, DNA was, uh, the plasmid DNA was expressed, translated, and we could demonstrate that. So it was a very exciting and uh, in exciting, uh, very exciting uh, time in, uh, in my career as I was just an undergraduate student. So when I decided to do my PhD, I went to the RNA lab. Uh, Professor Jenő Thomas was, uh, or he is still, uh, an organic chemist. And uh, when I entered to the lab, everybody was talking like uh, G, P, 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 G. And I, I didn't understand what it's all about. And then I learned that uh, 1978, when I started my PhD thesis, that the RNA has a cap. And actually, Ianu synthesized the cap analog and sent it to uh, Aaron Shotkin and Furuichi. And those who are familiar in the field knows that these are the people who identified that the messenger RNA has a cap. But they needed the reference material, and this is what Ianu prepared. There in the RNA lab, I, uh, where I started my PhD work uh, together with Janusz Ludwig. Janusz Ludwig is an organic chemist and uh, we were very good friends and stay till today. And I, every time I need help, I will always call him. So our role here was what uh, Janusz told us that we have to make a oligo -adenilat. This is a two prime, five prime. So usually the RNA is three prime, five prime, but this was a very interesting small molecule, two prime, five prime linked, and it was usually trimer or tetramer. And why it was an uh, exciting thing? Because uh, it was 1978 and the previous year, 77, Ian Kerr in, um, uh, discovered in, um, that this molecule is most likely responsible for uh, antiviral effects of uh, interferon. What was discovered that um, oligodenylate synthase in response activated by double stranded RNA can polymerize ATP to this molecule, and that can bind to RNAs L, a latent uh, ribonuclease, and then dimerize. And this will specifically will cut up the uh, single stranded RNA, and that's what is why interferon can inhibit uh, viral replication because this oligodenylate synthase is uh, interferon inducible. A company, a Hungarian pharmaceutical company, Kinoin, was interested in this molecule, so he gave us money to uh, develop it to an antiviral compound because in the 70s there were not one. Even today there is not many, but um, it was quite challenging because uh, uh, enzymatically it was easy to make, but uh, chemically it's not. One problem was that this fibrin phosphate was uh, degraded by phosphatases. So Janos was an organic chemist. He introduced a long decil molecule here, and we could show that this, this molecule was still functional and um, could activate RNAs. We did uh, many assays in, in vitro. As the problem was to deliver the cell, to deliver this molecule into the cell. So as we struggle with that, uh, Kinoin, you know, was um, less interested because, of course, what we can do with the molecule that we cannot deliver to the cell. And uh, our funding ended here. And uh, so uh, I had to cross the ocean and. Uh, get a job at uh, Temple University, and this was 19, 1985. Uh, Professor Suhadonik invited me, who worked at the uh, biochemistry department of Temple University, and uh, he was an um, uh, expert of nucleosides antibiotics, and um, uh, wrote a uh, textbook on that. 
And uh, he was, his favorite molecule was this deoxycopormycin, what he isolated from bacteria. And um, he was also working with cordycepin. Cordycepin was isolated from uh, uh, fungus, which very specifically can uh, uh, in insect, infect insects and grow on it, like seen here on this picture. And uh, Swadonik was also famous that he discovered that pseudouridine can be synthesized de novo in selected bacteria. But when I arrived, he didn't invite me to work in any of these molecules. He was also interested in the 2,5-A molecule. And when I arrived at the lab, we started to further modify it. One of them is what internucleotide linkage. So to make it more stable, we made phosphorothioate analogs of these uh, molecules. And uh, we, also not, we also changed the base itself. So introduced azido uh, uh, derivatives so that uh, this was mostly to capture this RNAs R molecule. We changed the sugar. So because as I mentioned, we already had cordycepin in the lab, and then we have just uh, removed this hydroxyl here. So that was easy to make a two prime, a five prime molecule because then the three prime, there were no hydroxyl present. And uh, we did in uh, his laboratory, we did all of this is enzymatically. And whereas colleagues in, in uh, Germany, uh, Wolfgang Fleiderer in Constance, he did also the same in chemically, because this was one of the goals to make chemically synthesized molecules. When uh, we did the phosphorothioate, then we could remove the phosphate, and this core molecule was also very, very active and uh, activated the RNAs. Uh, but just like in Hungary, the problem was that it worked very well in uh, this molecule in a cell-free assay, activated RNA cell, but <laughs> delivery to the cells was already problematic. But we know all of the uh, enzymes and system which was participated, you know, the, uh, in the interferon-induced mechanism. So the collaborators down in the Broad Street, Hahnemann University, asked us to help them with their clinical trial where they decided to use double stranded RNA to treat uh, uh, HIV patient. Here we are in the 1980s and um, uh, they needed uh, some kind of uh, uh, treatment because the AIDS patients were dying. And it was known that double stranded RNA, such as poly IC, homopolymer, can activate cells and the cells will make interferon. And it was discovered in 1960s, but Mm, this was very toxic as they tried out in the 70s using against viruses. So inducing interferon with double standard RNA treatment in patient was uh, not feasible. But uh, Carter and Paula Peter called, so they figured out if they introduce some mismatches to the double standard RNA, then this will be less immunogenic, uh, less uh, toxic and still immunogenic, sorry. So uh, they produced this uh, mismatch double stranded RNA and uh, delivered IV to the patient. I, for interest, I put here the dose, uh, 250 milligram double stranded RNA twice a week for 18 weeks. It seems that at the beginning that uh, it was uh, uh, helpful and um, some patients get better, but when the uh, trial was extended, there was uh, no effect was found. So um, I left the lab and went to Bethesda and spent there nine months and returned to Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania, where Elliot Barnett and a cardiologist hired me uh, to get into the faculty. And his goal was to clone urokinase receptor. Uh, it seemed, you know, the sequence already was available, but he wanted to have tools to generate uh, uh, plasmid and so on. And uh, so uh, he asked me that whether I know how to isolate RNA and Chomchinsky method came in 1987. And uh, PCR, PCR was introduced in 1987. I joined the lab here in 1989. So everything was just kind of ready. And TAG DNA polymerase was the molecule of the year in 1989. Uh, in science magazine. Uh, 
So everything was ready and I could uh, clone based on the known information. Of course, today it would be the today's project, but you know, it was uh, that time everything was difficult. And, uh, but something else uh, was, uh, became ready at that time and that was the uh, in vitro transcription of RNA. Uh, we could have plasmid and now with this PCR uh, method, we could uh, PCR clone anything if we have the tissue which expressed that uh, uh, interest of protein. We could perform transcription because T7 RNA polymerase became available in 1985. Uh, New England BioLab and uh, Promega uh, made it uh, commercially available and kept analog by Pharmacia in 1983. So we could make an RNA which had cap with coding sequence and polyethyl. And most importantly, because you already heard me telling that the delivery of the RNA or nucleic acid, even the small one, was uh, problematic, the lipofectin was introduced by uh, Bethesda Research Lab. And Phil Fagner uh, uh, developed this product in 1987 when it was commercially available. So, Elliot, who was just a couple of days younger than me, get enthusiastic like I am, and then we decided that we will do mRNA therapy. And, and so we did uh, so many different projects and um, tried to get uh, funding. I tried to get funding. I put here several examples for that. But um, the first rejection letter came in 1990 that um, when I did this uh, new approach for gene therapy, but uh, it was something that not uh, uh, appealing to the reviewers. Then I tried to get some company support and applied for a Merck, Merck uh, fund for $10,000, but uh, they thought that it is uh, likely not useful because it degrades this RNA. And anyway, it is uh, who the hell will uh, supervise me because it is too complex. Then with Elliot, we went to uh, uh, investors and then we presented to them and they promised that uh, they will give the money. And we submitted the grant, but I haven't heard from them up on, not even now. And then we tried to make, and uh, I made a circular RNA because all of the pieces was that it was uh, too label and degrade. So while we are uh, writing grants uh, during the night, during the day, we did a lot of experiment and the most important I am showing you here, which was um, for me uh, when I realized that uh, mRNA will be in therapy. The urokinase receptor, which I cloned, we delivered to this mRNA with the lipofactin to cells. And uh, I remember 19, actually it was 1996, Christmas when we were standing, Elliot, Alice and me in the front of the gum counter and try to see that whether the mRNA uh, encoded a functional uh, receptor and uh, the urokinase was labeled with iodine and we tried to see that whether it could still bind. And why it, is, it was so critical because the urokinase receptor is highly modified uh, post-translationally. First of all, it is glycosylated and it has also a GPI link and all of this needed for function. And we realized that it was functional. And uh, for me, this was the moment when I felt that the RNA will be, will be a therapy. But uh, we quickly uh, had to leave cardiology and I was so lucky that uh, David Langer, who I worked together in a cardiology while we, he was a student there and uh, he was uh, also uh, enthusiast of this mRNA therapy and he convinced the chairman to hire me, although I was demoted from my position, but uh, you know, the enthusiasm was there and uh, we did the uh, mRNA and uh, tried to use it for uh, something which is for neurosurgeon were interested. With David, we worked out and uh, we, uh, with some additives, we figured out how we can increase the translation efficiency of RNA with several logs. And we, of course, tried some experiment in the, uh, delivering RNA to, to the uh, red brain. But again, uh, things changed and he had to leave and the chairman left. And I was alone. 
up until I went to the Xerox machine where I met a new guy on the floor who just joined uh, University of Pennsylvania from Fauci's lab. And uh, I bragged him about that I can do any kind of mRNA. And he said that he's interested uh, to do a uh, uh, vaccine against HIV. So I made the gag mRNA for him, and he was so happy that this was uh, really a perfect uh, vaccine uh, candidate because it was immunogenic and so on. But I was not so happy because I want to develop the mRNA for therapy. And uh, immunogenicity was not a good news for me and try to understand for, for a couple of years, like here showing one of the examples that what makes the RNA immunogenic, whereas inside the cell, the RNA is not immunogenic. Why, why these RNA? What is the difference? So what element, uh, the cap, the foliate, what I have to do or not to do to make it less immunogenic? It obvious that when a long foliate was there, it was less immunogenic. Poly A itself was not, but poly U was very immunogenic when we tested out in the six cells. So we drew, we started these experiments and we made in vitro transcribed RNA and he tested out dendritic cells, whether they are in using uh, TNF alpha and uh, we isolated different kind of fraction type of RNA from cells and we found that, you know, mitochondrial RNA was the most immunogenic and bacterial RNA, but tRNA was not immunogenic. And of course, um, you know, there are many differences between these RNA, one is long, short, but definitely uh, tRNA was known the most, uh, containing the most uh, modified nucleosides. So when we replotted this uh, graph, we could see that uh, those um, RNA which had least modification are the most immunogenic. And when we had a lot of modification, then it is no immunogenicity. But how we could uh, prove that? So it's, as you know, all of the RNA is made from the four basic nucleotides naturally, and then post-transcriptionally post modification are introduced. And more than 100 uh, different one, and there are isomerization, methylation, and uh, ribose and the basis. And, and at that time, in 2004, it was not known what kind of function they have. Mostly they considered irreversible, and the modifying enzymes were not known. So how we could uh, do, and how we could do, uh, let's say, uh, remove these kind of, or, or introduce a modification here, or remove the modification there, and show that it is really not just a simple correlation. So we went to, and um, actually I asked my colleague <laughs> as many times, um, and uh, Janusz Ludwig told me that uh, uh, you can try to, uh, using uh, nucleus triphosphate and incorporate to the RNA. And uh, he, he recommended me to buy from Trilink. And it was good because when we checked, they have their uh, NTPs in high concentration, which fit with the megascript. And we could generate most of these RNA. And some, of course, obviously not incorporated because uh, you need hydrogen bonding also for transcription. And um, uh, when we had these uh, molecules, you know, we started to test out. And uh, we generated uh, uh, 293 cells overexpressing different toll-like receptor. Why that? Because in 2000, we are in 2004 now. In 2001, it was discovered that TLR3 was activated by double-stranded RNA, and we suspected that maybe our RNA activate uh, one of those receptors. And Indeed, when we did the introduce modification, these are the unmodified here in blue, but when we introduce modification that it seems that TLR8 and TLR7 on these human uh, cells were not activated. When we tested out on primary dendritic cells, what found is that only those which had uridine modified were non-active and not in using TNF or for other cytokines we also measured. So naturally, uridine looks like that, and uh, if we introduce to the RNA pseudouridine, 5-methyluridine, uh, or thiouridine, 
uh, those were not activated. Later, we tested also one methyl pseudouridine as well. Uh, so important was, you know, test out uh, uh, whether they can be translated. And S2U was not translatable, but pseudouridine translated 10 times better than the unmodified RNA. And uh, it was also in primary cells as well as uh, stable cell lines. Just to remind you that uh, this is how uridine looks and this is how pseudouridine. So telling you that uh, both of them has the same base. These are uracil, and only the linkage is different. So that is when uh, people are ref referring it that this is chemically modified. There is no chemically modified. Actually, the mole weight is identical, and there is no addition. It is just uh, uh, linkage is uh, linkage is different. So uh, we already were worried about the double-stranded RNA, which was present in our samples. And uh, we could detect this one is a double stranded RNA specific uh, antibodies, but uh, uh, we spent, I don't even know how many, probably two years, try to remove this uh, contaminant from uh, our RNA samples and uh, tested out many different chromatographical and uh, methods when finally. Uh, uh, Drew Perseverance paid off and then he set it up the HPSC to get rid of this uh, double stranded RNA and here showed that after HPSC purification no double stranded RNA was present and the RNA was still there. This uh, removing the contaminant uh, greatly improved translation efficiency especially in primary cells. Here in the blue is the HPSC purified sample and this is in low scale. So it seems that now we have, um, you know, this RNA is ready for prime time and uh, we tested out in vivo. These were delivered with a transit formulation in vivo animals and showing that very small amount of EPO mRNA were translated and we could detect quite time where the unmodified uh, uh, RNA, which also encoded EPO, uh, that disappeared much faster. And uh, when we injected this, uh, 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 the EPO was uh, functional because it increased the hematocrit in the mice. And when we in injected weekly, we could maintain high hematocrit level in, in the animals. So uh, we were very happy that now that here we are, we can use non-immunogenic RNA for all of these uh, applications, most of all protein replacement, which I was mostly interested. And uh, of course, Drew had his own uh, uh, RNA, the immunogenic RNA, which uh, was used for, it seems uh, optimal for infectious disease. And uh, you will hear him telling you that actually, this green will come over here, and why nucleosid modified non immunogenic RNA is uh, better for even infectious disease. In 2013, uh, end of it, November, I joined BioNTech, a company at that time was just uh, 140 people who were employed, no um, website, and uh, functioning in the university campus. And, um, I went there with my colleague Hiromi Muramatsu and we tried to make sure that these arrows here will be continuous because it was all of this uh, uh, protein replacement therapy project were in a preclinical phase and we decided that we will have to put this in the clinic. So Drew will tell you about uh, the infectious disease part in the last uh, minute or so. I would just like to thank all of the people who helped me for the years, my teachers in elementary school, in high school, at the University of Seged, and the Biological Research Center, which I already showed you, my colleagues who helped me in the project as an undergraduate student and as a graduate student at Temple University, collaborators at Hanuman University and Uniform Service University of Health Sciences, as well as in UPenn Cardiology, with Eliot Barnaton, 
helped me a lot. And then at uh, neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania. All of these colleagues always were very supportive and I am very grateful all of them. And of course, at UPenn, different department, those people were also some of them believers, or most of them believers of RNA, and of course, specifically Drew Weisman, who I work for that many years, and his colleague Norbert Cordy, who together they did uh, and showed that, uh, and including me to the studies, that uh, nucleoside modified RNA is a great vaccine. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Carrico, for that informative look back. We really appreciate you presenting today at mRNA Day. Um, we're already starting to see some questions coming in for Dr. Carrico. Please go ahead and submit those now. You can continue to submit questions throughout the entire presentation, and we will answer them all at the end. So next up, we have our presentation from Dr. Drew Weissman. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and he'll be discussing nucleoside-modified mRNA lipid, um, LNP therapeutics. Great, thank you. So I assume everybody can see my slides. Um, so Katie gave you the background of how we got to nucleoside modified mRNA. I want to now talk to you about some of the therapeutic applications that that, that we've done uh, and are currently doing. Um, let me start with my conflicts of interest. I have a bunch of patents, some of which have been licensed out. Um, I don't need to go through this because Katie has done that already. Um, let me just start with why do you want to use modified RNA? And there are multiple reasons. To me, the main one is that I'm a clinician also. When you make a protein drug, the way you do that is you grow the drug in large 50,000 liter drums. Um, you collect that supernatant and you develop and then utilize extensive purification systems to purify the protein away from all the, the culture medium components, adventitious viruses, and other things. But the issue is, and we've seen this multiple times, if something goes wrong in this process, if the CHO cells making the protein misfold it or misglycosylate it, the protein might be non-functional or worse, it might become immunogenic and induce a response against the therapeutic protein. And this led to, about 15 years ago, many deaths from aplastic anemia when they changed the production of erythropoietin. When you use mRNA, the host is the factory that produces the protein. And our cells know how to fold, know how to glycosylate, know how to modify proteins. In addition, mRNA is a simple reaction to make. It's a single tube reaction to make the RNA, a single tube to purify it, a single tube to put it into LNPs. And that procedure is identical no matter what the coding sequence is. For proteins, you have to reinvent everything for every new protein that you're going to use. So let me start with our LNP uh, mRNA platform. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because now that Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna have reported their phase three trials and Pfizer, BioNTech have now applied for emergency authorization, the, the, this vaccine platform is on everybody's lips. Um, but let me start with our initial studies where we took nucleoside modified and purified mRNA that induced no inflammatory cytokines, no type 1 interferons, and we encoded influenza hemagglutinin. We immunized mice once, and we compared that to the inactivated virus that's currently used in us adults as a vaccine, as well as a live virus in the nose of mice, which is what's often used in kids. And what we saw is that the mRNA vaccine gave titers that were 50-fold higher than the inactivated virus and five times higher than the live virus. This was unbelievable. 
you're not supposed to develop titers higher than a live virus infection and to be 50 times higher than the current vaccine platform was an incredible finding. So the next thing we did is we wanted to understand where this response was coming from. So this is a diagram of how B cell responses form. And you start with a follicular B cell that interacts with the virus, with antigen, with activators, that the B cell interacts with CD4 helper cells and moves into the germinal center. In the germinal center, it rapidly proliferates, affinity matures, and becomes plasma cells and memory B cells. So we measured all of these populations using an antigen-specific assay. So what we did is we fluorescently labeled the HA protein, and we're only quantitating HA-specific B cells of each distinct phenotype listed here. And what was striking is that compared to the inactivated virus, we were making a log and a half more germinal center B cells, memory B cells, and long-lived plasma cells. So that's where that 50-fold increase in antibody neutralization titers came from. What was even more striking is we, we forgot about some mice for about 13 months after a single immunization. And we went back and we measured long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow. And you can see here that this is an incredibly high number of plasma cells. These are all specific for HA. These numbers are higher than any other progenitor cell in the bone marrow. And when we looked at the spleen, we saw very high levels of memory B cells. Now, th this is 13 months in a mouse after a single immunization. So th these are incredibly potent responses. We then searched for the mechanism of this, and the mechanism turned out to be T follicular helper cells. So this is a specialized CD4 helper population whose job it is is to form germinal centers where they interact with germinal center B cells and drive B cell proliferation, affinity maturation, class switch, and the generation of long-lived memory and plasma cells. In the absence of TFH, T follicular helper cells, you don't make germinal centers and you have lousy antibody responses. Most vaccine adjuvants and vaccines that people develop for antibody responses, they're trying to develop TFH cells. We measured TFH cells, and in this case, these are macaques that were immunized with an HIV vaccine. And we compared it to an envelope protein plus a double-stranded RNA adjuvant. It's been reported that double-stranded RNA is one of the most potent TFH-inducing adjuvants known. Here we're measuring total TFH cells. Here, these are envelope-specific TFHs. And we can see that the, the double-stranded RNA adjuvant had really no effect on induction of TFH cells. But the mRNA LNP platform induced incredible levels of TFH cells. We've seen identical results with many different immunogens. So this is a characteristic of the modified RNA LNP vaccine platform. So our conclusions at this point were that the mRNA vaccine induced incredibly potent neutralizing antibody responses. But what was truly striking is that most vaccines and adjuvants typically induce about 5 to 10 percent of all the CD4 helpers are TFH phenotype. With the mRNA LNP platform, we induce really potent CD4 helper responses, and half of those cells were T follicular helper cells. The TFH response drives potent B cell responses, giving very high titer binding and neutralizing antibody titers that, that are 10 to 50 times higher than other vaccine platforms. The germinal centers are very long-lived. And another striking thing is that with a single immunization, 
we get IgG at high titers 10 days after a single immunization. If you know vaccines and immunology, the first time you're immunized, you make an IgM response. And the IgG slowly comes up weeks later, and it requires a second immunization to see a potent IgG response. Now, another thing that's striking about the mRNA LNP vaccine is where those responses are directed. So this is the structure of a hemagglutinin molecule. It contains two main regions, the head. The head is, that, is what binds the sialic acid on respiratory epithelial cells and what the HAI response is directed against. It also mutates very rapidly, which is why we have to make new influenza vaccines every year. And then there's the stalk. The stalk mediates viral envelope fusion in the endosome. It's more conserved. It, it, it rarely mutates. When we looked at a full-length HA immunization, we set up an ELISA assay where here we've got a full-length HA in the plate. Here we've got an HA where the H1 stock, and, and we immunize with an H1 HA, with an H6 head. The H6 head is a group two, very distant. No responses against an H6 head are induced by an H1 head. So here we're measuring only stock responses. And what we saw is that with a prime, we got very potent stock responses. And when we boosted it, that, that response was boosted potently. We challenged animals. So I'll, I'll quickly review uh, HA, uh, uh, influenza immunology and challenge. Typically, most vaccines immunize homologous neutralization. So they neutralize the virus where the HA immunogen came from. They don't neutralize mutated or distant HAs, even in the same class, H1 in this case. In this case, we challenged with a virus that was a 1934. This is a 2009 virus. And when we measured, there was no head response at all to this HA. So the virus we're challenging with has no head response at all. And head is the main site of neutralization. But when we challenged these animals, they were completely protected from infection no matter what dose of HA we use. To make it more interesting, we took animals with the ACAL7, this is an H1 virus, and challenged them with a very distant H5 avian virus. And again, the animals were completely protected from infection. They had no head neutralizing activity. So th these two experiments show that the mRNA LNP vaccine using a lousy immunogen for stock responses, a full length HA, can induce incredibly potent stock directed responses. And it's the basis of a universal influenza vaccine that we're developing. So our conclusion is that the mRNA LNP vaccine with influenza induces an incredibly potent response with a single immunization the TFH response drives subdominant epitopes. So what that means is that for most immunogens, there are the dominant epitopes where the prior, most of the responses are directed, and there are subdominant responses that you want the responses to go against, but you never see them. With the mRNA LNP vaccine, because of the persistence of antigen and the presence of TFH cells, we're getting potent subdominant responses. We've seen similar with HSV, HIV, and malaria vaccines, and suspect it occurs with all vaccines that we're studying. So we have a bunch of vaccines under study. This is an old list. There's probably about three times more that we're currently working on. Now, I didn't mention this before, but we're a bag of RNAs which means that if you inject a naked RNA into us, it's degraded very rapidly. So we studied and analyzed 
30 or 40 different formulations to figure out what's the best way to deliver mRNA in vivo. And we finally settled on lipid nanoparticles. The, the, it's composed of four lipids that self-assemble into about 80 nanometer particles. It's currently uh, used in an FDA-approved drug for genetic amyloidosis, and it binds ApoE in the circulation, which targets it to the liver. We confirm that by making luciferase mRNA LNPs and injecting these into mice by a variety of routes. And what was striking is that anything that had systemic circulation went to the liver as expected. But when we injected at distant sites like intradermal or subcutaneous or IM, we retained expression at the site of injection, and that expression lasted for a long time. So we followed mice out to about two weeks and maintained expression of the mRNA. Now that, that leaves a problem. So if you want to deliver to the liver, then you can inject IV. And if you want to deliver to a local site, you can inject at that local site. But what if you want to target something else? What if you want to target bone marrow stem cells or T cells or brain? So we, we developed a, a new method where we linked antibodies or pieces of antibodies to the end of a PEG lipid molecule and incorporated these into the LNP with the view that we could now target the LNPs to specific cell types. When we did this, the LNPs maintained their size and shape. They were about 20 nanometers bigger, which is about the size of a coating of antibody. Polydispersity and surface charge remained unchanged, and the particles maintained function, but they could now be targeted to specific organs. So here we're, we're using anti-PCAM antibodies, and PCAM is expressed by endothelial cells. Here we're targeting lungs. Lungs have the highest number of endothelial cell capillaries in the body. So with the addition of PCAM, we selectively target lung versus liver. So our conclusions from this half are that LNPs can be targeted to many different cell types and organs. So far, we've targeted brain, heart, lung, dendritic cells, T cells, bone marrow stem cells, and CD4 positive cells. We're currently developing systems to pharmaceutically produce these molecules so we can begin clinical trials. Let me end by thanking everybody that's been involved in these studies. The, the two most important are, of course, Katie Carrico, who we developed the technology with, and Norbert Pardee, who did all of the vaccine studies. Um, I'll thank uh, John Epstein's lab for the cardiac fibrosis studies and all of my other collaborators. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Weissman, for that excellent presentation. Again, we really appreciate you joining us today for mRNA Day 2020. All right, so we're now moving into the question and answer portion of our mRNA Day online symposium. So I see that we've already received quite a few questions from the audience. Please continue to submit those as we go. We will try and get to as many as possible within the time that we have allotted. All right, so our very first question is for both presenters. And it is, what future applications mRNA are you most excited about? Uh, I guess I should probably start with that one. I, mean, I, I think it's obviously the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, both Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech have licensed nucleoside modified mRNA technology that Katie and I developed. And their the phase three results show 95% efficacy, which is unbelievable. Um, and um, I, you know, I, I hope that this significantly dents the current pandemic. 
Dr. Carrico, anything to add on this question? No, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. What would you say was the turning point for mRNA therapeutics? I think that with Drew, we agree that one of the major turning points was when people read our paper, not when, you know, and then they repeated the, the application and then their paper was published. So as uh, we were waiting when our paper was published that somebody will respond and, you know, application and other thing, but uh, we waited and waited. And I mean, we did a lot of experiment, of course, in time, but, it seemed that um, uh, it was just uh, too early for most of the people. They were just remember that uh, RNA is so label, and I don't know what uh, they were thinking. But uh, uh, what do you think, Drew? No, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I think we were early. Um, it took them a few years, but it, it finally caught on, and you know, it's it will hopefully change the world. All right, our next question is, what innovations are still needed to overcome challenges in the field? I think that uh, we agree the, you know, the formulation targeted, that Drew presented a nice data about that. But um, for, uh, if we want to uh, use for therapeutic purpose and the protein is secreted, then most of the time we can reach any cells and it will secrete the protein and get to the circulation. But when we want to uh, treat something that uh, some kind of disease where intracellular protein is needed, then we have to reach that specific cells to make sure that the protein is made in those. And that's quite challenging. Others is, is that it is not going through several layers of tissue. So delivering to the brain, I mean, we tried, we, uh, most of the, so it could uh, go to the uh, ventricles and then the surface protein, you know, cell, uh, the surface protein on, on the ventricles can make uh, protein, but it won't penetrate through several layers. So it, it cannot be used. Drew? So uh, I'm a clinician and um, if you look at the COVID vaccine from Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech, the issues are one, we need two immunizations, and two, there's a lot of reactogenicity. So 80% of people get a sore arm, 10% uh, get flu-like syndromes. Those are really high adverse events. What Ware and others are doing now is trying to make vaccines that a single immunization will work and have much lower adverse events, so it's better tolerated. And I think that's gonna be important for getting the world to take vaccines. All right, our next question is a little more technical. Is the positive effect of introducing modifications to the mRNA similar across all cell types, or are there modification-specific preferences for certain cell types that you may be trying to target? I mean, we use uh, one kind of uh, modification, as I showed, that uridine has to be modified. And now we know because toll, like receptor 7 and toll 8 is activated by uridine. So I guess that uh, as long as the cell has uh, endosome, then we have to modify the uridine. And of course, we selected, we selected, you know, the pseudouridine because it is naturally occurring. This is the fifth most uh, abundant uh, modified nucleoside in our body. All right, so our next question here is regarding antibodies. For antibody delivery, do you think mRNA is better than DNA based on delivery time, address spec, et cetera? So you're breaking up a little. Um, so uh, Dave Weiner and Anovio have been using DNA to deliver antibodies. Um, it's hard to compare. The main differences that we see is that RNA gives a much higher peak level. 
in a mouse with a mg per kg of RNA, we, we get 600 micrograms per mil of antibody. Um, DNA tends to give you lower levels of antibody, but the, the claim is that because the DNA is translated longer, you'll get a longer duration. Um, but you know, we haven't done head-to-head -head comparison, so I'm not sure. All right, thank you. All right, next question. What is your forecast for the mRNA therapeutics landscape short term now that we've started to see developments with the vaccine side? I think probably we will be the next vaccines will coming. Isn't that true? Yeah, so we've got a lot of vaccines in, in development. All right, so here's our next question. Is it possible to modify the RNA backbone to make it more stable? I mean, the RNA stability is, uh, the problem is that the phosphodiester linkage, and um, if you make a phosphorotyroid, then the RNA will be not translatable. And of course, it will be unnatural, and we don't know what kind of uh, toxicity it will cause. Two prime material, you know, would be also stable, but uh, some suggest that it, uh, first of all, it is not incorporating to the RNA using the polymerase, and also not sure that whether it will be translated when all of them is uh, changed this way. So in the, we didn't show the data here, but what we've previously published that using pseudouridine modified RNA, the, the duration of protein translation from that RNA is extended compared to an unmodified RNA, likely because it's, it's better loaded into polysomes uh, and is less able to be degraded in a cell. And we also showed that the RNAs L is not cleaving because RNA cell is specific for uridine, and when it is pseudouridine there, at least one intracellular uh, RNA is not uh, degrading. But it will be degraded, of course. All right, so our next question is on the topic of modified nucleotides. Do you think that the universe of possible modified nucleotides has been explored, or is there more room for development still? I mean, we try, uh, first of all, there are many modified nucleoside, nucleotides and, uh, you know, uh, for transcription, if you want to incorporate by transcription, it had to form hydrogen bonding with the DNA. And then when it you translate, it also had to form hydrogen bonding with the tRNA. So uh, uh, that's a requirement. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uridine must be modified because that's what makes the RNA immunogenic. So I think that we people tested most of the uh, naturally occurring uridine. We, we the drew very much want uh, to use only naturally occurring uh, uh, modified nucleosides because uh, you remember the sphialuridine, uh, which is a, a fluorinated analog of uridine, caused several deaths when it was tested in a, in a trial by NIH. I agree. So as a, as a follow up to that question, when you were first testing nucleotide modifications for mRNA, how did you select the nucleotides that you tested? Uh, what was available from the trial? <laughs> we ordered everything which was triphosphate and it was high concentration and we just tested out what uh, RNA we could uh, make and that was also surprising actually we also get the uh, mutated uh, t7 rna polymerase because at the beginning we thought that the regular rna polymerase will not incorporate but we found that it incorporated these nucleotides as well perfect all right so we're actually getting several questions here on lipid nanoparticles so we're going to move to that topic now um, so first question on lipid nanoparticles how much does the formulation have to be tailored to the mRNA sequence? So is this something that could eventually be just a standardized platform, or is there a lot of development necessary for each specific LNP? 
So we optimize the LNPs for efficacy, not for the sequence of the mRNA. Um, the only time sequence is an issue is for very long RNA, so greater than 10 kb. Then you have to alter the formulation to be able to incorporate an RNA that size. But we, we use the same LNP formulation that works best in our hands for every RNA coding sequence. All right, so our next question. Oh, go ahead. I just said agree. All right, our next question on LNPs. How much of a concern is LNP immunogenicity for repeated dosing of mRNA therapeutics? So you don't see immunogenicity against the LNP. You know, the, the only structure that you could make a, an antibody or a T-cell response is the PEG. And the way LNPs are formulated, they use a C14 lipid tail on the PEG lipid. So when the LNPs are put into a person or a mouse or whatever, the PEG lipid falls off within 15 minutes. So that, that, that you, you, taking the PEG away from a particle makes it much less immunogenic. All right, so our next question. Um, are there any applications that mRNA is specifically well suited for compared to existing technologies? Uh, of course. You know that uh, uh, when we started with Drew and even when I started myself in the 90s, everything was uh, gene therapy because uh, everything wanted something like permanent and. Uh, and uh, many application requires short uh, translations, so it is uh, beneficial to have some protein only uh, present temporarily. It's like a vaccination also is not good if you would have for for uh, weeks uh, present the protein encoding by the RNA. And uh, many other application where uh, you know the pain or wound healing and others is uh, short. Uh, short translation is uh, much better than something would be extended and it could be uh, detrimental. And of course, is, our messenger RNA is not good for everything. I would not vision to use insulin because, you know, the therapeutic window is very narrow and, you know, it's not uh, applicable for that. But uh, other application, do, do you want something that you see that specific for mRNA? Many, many, yeah? Yeah, no, so I, I completely agree. I mean, the, the, the fibrosis CAR T's I just showed you, you don't want to have a fibrosis specific CAR T in your body for a long time because we'll fall apart. All of our collagen fibrosis will be degraded, uh, which is not good. Yeah, so what was considered detriment that the RNA degrade actually is a great benefit. All right, so our next question here. The speed that the COVID vaccines have reached the FDA is really impressive, unprecedented. So how, how do you think this experience will change the pace of future vaccine and therapeutic development? <laughs> Um, sure. So, you know, people are somewhat concerned by the speed that the COVID vaccines have been made. But what, you know, so I, I, I've been involved, I, I've talked to the leaders of these companies and, and the scientists who are developing them. And the one thing that everybody agrees on is that no shortcuts have been taken. So, you know, it, it would be a disaster if, if they skipped some toxicity steps and something bad happened. Um, but what, what I think this means is that the, the follow-up vaccines can probably be done nearly as fast. And with the acceptance of COVID-19 vaccines, 
the following the follow up vaccines will have a much easier route to approval and acceptance by the world. Uh, so I, I think it's going to speed up vaccine development. And one of the criticism was not just that it is oh it is so so quick, but also that um, you know it was um, no uh, mRNA vaccine uh, was available and approved up until that. But if uh, it was clear from my presentation, you could see that it couldn't be when RNA polymerase was not available till '85, and um, you know we just could uh, PCR out uh, a different kind of uh, target, but. Uh, gene synthesis, it didn't come until the early 2000s when we could just order something, you know, and um, and uh, we, can, we could make as we like and make RNA from it. So the technology uh, development was not there. And why we don't have, uh, why we don't have a, a mRNA vaccine is not because something was tried and failed. Like in the case of double-stranded RNA, you could see that the 60s, they tried many, many times and none of them is in the clinic because uh, it failed. But messenger RNA therapy or vaccine never failed. So that's an important difference. All right, so our next question here is on the topic of stability. So is there any way to move away from low temperature storage of mRNA vaccines and therapeutics, for example, lyophilization? So we're currently working with one of the LNP companies that is able to lyophilize uh, mRNA LNPs and they retain function, they can be stored at room temperature or higher temperatures. The, the issue with it is that it, it greatly increases the cost of the vaccine because lyophilization is expensive. If you look at, so the, the, the way you determine stability is it's a GMP development procedure. So while you're making your GMP RNA, you determine what stability parameters you want to test. Um, and you, Moderna can keep their vaccine at regular freezer temperatures for a month or two, I believe. Um, that's because they developed that when they were doing their GMP preparation. I think that needs to be explored. And my guess is that LNP formulations that are stable at minus 20 regular freezer temps are, are certainly possible. And uh, we just have to extend that to longer time periods. I don't think LNPs as a liquid will ever be stable for months at room temperature. Uh, but you know, th there are alternatives, four degrees minus 20, th that are much more uh, appeasing to people. I cannot comment on that. All right, so our next question here is actually a couple questions on this topic um, regarding LNPs. So are LNPs essential for vaccination versus injecting, for example, naked mRNA or using electroporation? Yeah, so the, this is the work that, that Norbert Pardee and I have done, which is what we discovered that the lipid nanoparticles that we're using have adjuvant activity, but it's completely different from all other adjuvants used. Most adjuvants like alum, uh, uh, CPG, induce a Th1 or Th2 type T cell response. And th that's good if you want to make CD8s. Uh, and it's not good if you want to make antibodies. What we found is that the LNPs have an adjuvant activity that induces T follicular helper cells. They're the critical cell for driving antibody production. So you know, we got lucky that the LNPs were A, great to deliver RNA in vivo and weren't toxic, but it turned out they also have adjuvant activity 
that makes T follicular helper cells and drives really potent antibody responses. All right, so our next question here <clears throat> is actually directed to Dr. Carrico. So Dr. Carrico, you mentioned that you make circular mRNA. Are there any advantages to circular mRNA over the linear? I mean, uh, the point when I made, I assume that only RNA degrades from the three prime end and the five prime end, and I thought that uh, it would be more stable if I circulate. And it is true, the circular RNA naturally actually occurring in mammalian cells is uh, more stable. Of course, now that the translation is an issue because there is no cap and um, uh, cap independent translation is not as effective. <clears throat> But uh, there are more and more paper out there now that uh, showing that uh, circular RNA is um, can be made to translatable and uh, demonstrated extended translation. Maybe the level is not that high, but uh, uh, for certain application where lower level of protein is needed for extended time, that could have an advantage. All right, so our next question here is, compared to other vaccine platforms, are there any advantages to mRNA vaccines being seen across, for example, wider ranges of age groups or underlying conditions? I think you have to look at the results of the phase one clinical trials. And what they showed from both Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech is that elderly people had very good responses. That's not seen with a lot of vaccine platforms. We know for influenza that elderly have very poor responses. Um, so th there hasn't been a head-to-head -head comparison, but I I'm very, very happy that the elderly people studied all had neutralizing antibody responses. No comment. All right, so we are coming up on time. We have time for just a few more questions. So again, I encourage the audience, you've been sending in quite a few, but if you have any other questions, please feel free to keep sending them in through the questions panel. So our next question here is, what message would you give to current students, postdocs, and young investigators that are either entering the mRNA field now, considering it, or already involved? I mean, my presentation was uh, address uh, some part to those young people who would uh, think that, uh, you know, whatever they are doing, they might think that uh, not, you know, they, they don't see uh, those, um, I, okay. As Steve Jobs said, you just connect the dots <laughs> when you look back. So when I was doing a little lipid and formulation and liposome or then going the RNA field, I, I didn't know that one day it all comes together and uh, so that uh, as long as you are uh, excited what you are doing, then it just uh, other people can see that you are struggling. You, as long as it is uh, um, uh, get result and you enjoy, then then you just pursue that. And I don't know, that was, you know, with uh, Drew, we were <laughs> so enthusiastic and <laughs> trying new things and come up uh, oh, reading things. And so that, uh, yeah, so enthusiasm and happiness. So it has to be, if you are not happy in the lab, then it's not for you. This, this, is, this job is not for everybody. It's not a job really as a passion and and uh, so if uh, if you like it and and uh, you know the reward is to see a jail to see some band and you can be happy with that then then you you will be happy scientist uh, I think the RNA field is going to be expanding enormously over the next years. So I, th I think it's a great time to get into the lab and study RNA, uh, develop your own therapeutic, come up with your own ideas. Um, and you know, the, the, everybody in the world is getting a COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of them are gonna be mRNA. 
uh, so it, it's a great time for RNA research. Our next question here. Um, do you think that cocktails of mRNA may become popular for use by just using single mRNA therapeutics and vaccines? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand what you said. I, I couldn't hear it. No problem, I'll repeat. Um, do you believe that cocktails of different mRNAs may become popular for therapeutics and vaccines, or do you expect to just see single mRNA therapeutics? So we've got uh, a genital herpes vaccine that will go into clinical trials soon that has three mRNA for three different immunogens. We've got uh, a couple of vaccines that have 20 different RNAs mixed together. And when we analyze, we get good responses to all 20 immunogens. So you know, people ask me, maybe someday when you're a kid, you'll get a single RNA vaccine for all of your vaccines. Um, I, I don't think that's possible, but we can put 20 in a single vaccine. All right, so our next question here. Are there any challenges that you encountered moving from mice into humans with mRNA therapeutics? I, one of the uh, things what people forget that uh, the mice, for example, do not have toll like receptor 8. And uh, something which was not immunogenic in mice can become immunogenic in human. And of course, you know, the size, the 3,000 times uh, a human is larger than a mice. But uh, luckily, the uh, vaccine dose didn't have to proportionally uh, increase. It seems like uh, it, the same dose which was protective for a mice, almost uh, protective for a human as well. I think the big fear that we and everybody has is, is is based on the DNA field, where DNA vaccines work great in mice, but in macaques, you have to put in five milligrams of DNA and you don't get a response. And in humans, the first DNA vaccines gave no response. So it worked great in mice, but that was it. Uh, our, our fear was always the RNA would work great in mice, but maybe not in a bigger animal. So we we actually did macaque studies very early on, and and were relieved when when the macaque studies worked. All right, and we are coming up on time, so this is going to be our very last question here. Um, in the future, do you foresee us getting down to cell specific therapeutic mRNAs? Did you say site site specific? Cell specific, so cell very cell targeted only and only functioning in a very specific site. Yes, this kind of study is already done, and uh, um, because there is no promoter here, you know, for the DNA therapy, but uh, relying on microRNA uh, presence in selected cells, uh, others are already showed that uh, delivering an RNA. Although it is taken up by other type of cells, you know, different type of cells, but in those cells you do not want the RNA to be translated. The incorporated microRNA site will degrade uh, that RNA, and only selected cells will translate. So the not the delivery is selective. I mean, Drew presented already that it can be done also, but uh, even uh, incorporating elements to the RNA can make it uh, uh, cell selective.
All right, and that brings us to the end of our question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrico and Weissman, Dr. Weissman for joining us today. And thank you to everyone out in the audience. We are glad that you were able to join us today for MC20. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.